Father in heaven, we are thrilled with the message that we are all a part of. We are especially grateful, Lord, for the knowledge we have of Jesus as our Savior and for the life-changing power that comes from his gift on the cross of Calvary. We ask, Father, that you would bless us now, that you would enlighten our minds and strengthen us for the tasks, the mission, and the work that you give to each one is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my wife is very anxious that I clarify something that is in the program. My wife's name is not Chloe. <laughs> Chloe. I'm not sure, I'm not trying to point any fingers, but um, I don't work for the ministry that uh, is listed there. The, the description in the program is totally in error as far as who I am. It just happens to have my name. My wife's name is April, just like the month. And um, I work for the General Conference as Associate Health Ministries Director. And I am particularly, my portfolio includes nutrition. And I am a nutritionist and a dietitian. I am a pastor. And I have my doctorate in public health. And I have been in the General Conference for four years. Uh, for the past four years. And I have the privilege today of traveling around the world, really, and interfacing with those who are really doing health ministry in many different parts and corners of this earth. I, I am thrilled to see what God is doing in many, many, many of these projects. Um, let me just tell you one quick story because I just recently heard it. We have in the city of Kiev in the Ukraine recently opened the Adventist, uh, the Adventist, the Kiev Adventist Medical Center. Now, when you see the word medical center, you may think of Loma Linda University or, or uh, Florida Hospital. This is a lovely building. It was almost 10 years in the building and, and the development. Um, there's a lot of sacrificial giving has gone into the preparation of this center. And it's a large, uh, it's really a remarkably large um, structure. Um, it went through, uh, it was in, originally started and then the church was able, or some people, some Adventists were able to buy it. And then they began, because the construction had stopped and they kind of shelled it in and then there were problems and then they ran out of money and this is a 10 year process. But they have room in it for classes, several beautiful amphitheaters. They've just finished one of them. And I just want to tell you a story uh, that I just recently learned of, and, and you're well aware that the country of Ukraine is in turmoil today and uh, no one really knows what's going to happen there. And their grand opening in which they were starting with a class that they called How to Sleep on the first night you could hear on the highway a block away the military trucks and even some gunfire uh, during that night. They were, the staff in the morning got together for prayer and said, do we go ahead or should we just not do anything? And they said, no, they felt really impressed the Lord would have them go ahead. And so they opened that program at 6 p.m. that evening. And rather than 20 or 30 people, they had 65 people come to the class. One of the ladies, and it was a three-night class, and they weren't sure whether they'd be able to even have the privilege of the second night or the third night. But one of the ladies that came to that class came up and talked to our doctor who 
was doing the lecturing on the third night and said this, I need to tell you that this class has saved my life. And he said, well, tell me a little more. I just thank the Lord for that. She said on the first day, started on a Tuesday. Now this is Thursday evening. On Tuesday morning, she and her two children found a building that was 10 stories tall and they found access to the roof. And she had decided that all three of them were going to jump off because she was so discouraged on her. And they were going to do that the next day. She had just was casing the joint, so to speak. The f that evening on the way down the stairs, as they went out the building, they saw a poster for this class, how to sleep. They hadn't heard about Adventists. They hadn't heard about the Adventist, the Kiev Adventist Medical Center. And they did, she decided to come. She left her children. They were young children. She left them with somebody. I just still don't know who. And she came to the class. And at the end of that class, she said to herself the first night, I'll do it Thursday. I need to come back tomorrow night. The next night, she said, I'll do it Friday. I need to do it. I need to come back for the last class. During the last class, the Holy Spirit brought conviction to her heart that her life was worth more than what she thought it was, would be. And she told the doctor, she said, you have saved my life and the life of my children. And she told him the story. And he sat down with her and he prayed with her the first time anybody had ever prayed with her in her life. And he invited her to come the next evening to their home, he and his wife, and have a meal. And she happily agreed. And that evening, he offered to study the Bible with her. And what is so thrilling to me is that now, several months later, tomorrow, it is the plan that she will be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. God works through these means. And I want to just share with you some principles that I have learned along the way that I th hope will be helpful to you in your local churches as you look to carry out health ministry in the way that God wants you to do it. But as we begin, I'd like to ask the question, what is health ministry? And a lot of people have different ideas of what it is. People think it's selling, you know, this supplement or selling this product. Some people think it's um, taking people for a walk. Other people think it's cooking classes. Other people think it's various kinds of things. And it can be all of those. Well, I'm not sure about selling things other than good information, but we'll come to that. But I would like to just ask you to think carefully about what health ministry is all about. And I would like at the beginning to suggest to you that it is not just a set of scientifically established health practices that prolong and preserve life. It's more than that. It is more profoundly important than its component parts of balanced nutrition, exercise, uh, rest, water, sleep, whatever. It can do far more than modern science has discovered or demonstrated. The Seventh-day Adventist health message, when rightly understood and linked with Scripture and the God of Scripture, can bring the dead to life. Amen. And we'll come back to that concept of bringing the dead to life. 
When we confine any part of the health message merely to its scientifically validated facts, we are tragically shortcoming our audience of the eternal health benefits that only come from our Savior Jesus. And so I would like to, with that as an introduction, I'm going to share with you some broad principles that I believe are very important in carrying out effective health ministry in the local church, actually anywhere. But the first one is that we need to share Jesus as the only effective agent of change. You know, I was a freshly minted health educator. I had my doctorate of public health, and I was invited to come to a large city church to develop in that community a health outreach program that reached out to the community that surrounded the church. It was a very well-to-do community. The church members initially said, would you please come and live near the church? But there was no way that we could even afford to live anywhere near the church. We located 12 miles away and drove in. I was excited about health ministry. I wanted to share Jesus with the people who came to our programs. But I didn't know how to do it. I was told by one of my church members that most everybody that would come through the door to the program would be Jewish. And I didn't want to offend them. And so as I began working in that community, I didn't begin a program with prayer. I made a few veiled references to divine aid. I may have spoken about the creator in terms of the wonderful creation of the human body and the need to take care of it. But I was very, I didn't even finish with a benediction because I was afraid that I would offend those who were coming. They were secular, that's for sure. I'm not sure that very many of them had much interest in spiritual things. And I had worked for about a year and a half and I was very frustrated in my, in my own soul. I believed I needed to go out and meet these people and get acquainted with them and so I would tell them that if that I would be phoning them and I would be trying to set up a visit with them and I would knock on the door at the appointed time and they would welcome me in. I was a known person. They were coming. They seemed to be benefiting. I mean, they seemed to enjoy the programs. But I would ask them questions like, how are the, you doing physically? And they could tell me about how much better they were feeling. And some of them would tell me passionately about all the improvements that they had felt in their own lives. And I thought, wonderful, praise the Lord. I'd ask them how they were doing emotionally. And they could tell me they were feeling better, maybe a little less depressed, or they didn't have the ups and downs, their mood was improved. I thought, praise the Lord. But then when I asked them how they were doing spiritually, most of them would say, by the way, did you know the weatherman says it's going to snow tomorrow? Or who do you think is going to win the ball game tomorrow night? And they were telling me something. They were telling me they were not comfortable in talking to me about spiritual things. I, they may not have been comfortable at all, but they certainly weren't comfortable in talking to me about them. And it really, really frustrated me. And I tried many different ways, but I still offered the programs in the same way. And then one day, an old family friend, who was probably about my age at that time, but I thought he was really old, 
had just retired and he was traveling around the country and he called me up and he said, could I come and spend a couple of days with you? Well, he spent about four or five days and we were happy to have him. We had known him for many years and had looked up to him. And he wasn't a trained health educator, but in his stay there, he, you know, I invited him to come with me on some visits and he saw what was going on. And I came, he came to uh, some of the programs and he saw what was going on there. And as we were driving in the car together, I bared my soul and I said, I'm really frustrated. This is not what I had counted on. You know, I have these visits and you see what the response is. They're warm. They ask me questions about diet. They ask me questions about exercise. They see me as somebody that, that has something to share with them. They keep coming back to our programs. But when I try and talk to them about spiritual things, nothing happens. He didn't say much. He said he's noticed that. <laughs> On the last morning, he said he'd like to talk with me for a few minutes, and he, I knew he was leaving. And so we sat down together, and he said this to me that I have never forgotten. He said, Fred, I hear your frustration. I've seen it in your face. I hear your heart cry but I would just like to share one word of counsel with you. He said, if you don't identify yourself as a spiritual person, you will never accomplish what God has called you to do. And I said to him, but I love the Lord. He said, I know you do. He said, you preach on Sabbath morning. And no one questions it. Everybody knows. But he said, in your health programs, they don't see you as a spiritual person. I said, but how can I change that? He said, Fred, I'm not a health educator. But he said, I'd make a suggestion. He said, I think you ought to start with a little prayer and maybe just a spiritual thought from the Bible. He said, it doesn't have to be very long. And then it was time for him to leave, and he left me very, con somewhat encouraged, but very confused as to how I could identify myself as a spiritual person. I had to get down on my knees, and I said, Lord, what do I do? I, I, I could see maybe starting with a brief prayer, but how would I speak to people at a nutrition class about the Bible? And I struggled and wrestled for weeks in my own soul as to how I could identify myself as a spiritual person. Our programs were going on. And finally one day the Lord brought conviction to me that the following night when we started the cooking class, the following night, it was an ongoing cooking class, that on that night we were going to be talking about sugar or desserts, and I was going to talk a little bit about sugar, that that was the night I had to identify myself as a spiritual person. And it, I didn't have much peace in my soul, and I kept saying, Lord, how do I do it? And I still can remember the next day, saying, what am I going to say? How am I going to begin this class? And in the afternoon, the Lord, I think, impressed me with, some passage, with a couple of passages in the book of Proverbs. Now, that's not New Testament, so the Jews shouldn't be too offended. And... Um, it was the, you know, the King of Solomon, uh, King Solomon and his writings. And the, the passages had to do with using sweetness moderately. And the danger of too much sweetness. That didn't go into the nutritional part of it. So that evening, with a great deal of fear and trepidation, I opened my Bible, 
And in probably about three minutes, if I remember right, I read those passages, made a few short comments as an introduction to the topic of the evening, asked people to bow their heads, and had a brief prayer. Nobody got up and left, which I was greatly relieved for. They seemed to enjoy the class, like all the rest. That week, I visited two people who were in that class. And I knocked on the first door. They, opened, they welcomed me in just as usual. They introduced me to their husband. They said, please sit down. They both came and sat down. And the lady said this. I had no idea the Bible had anything to say about health. She didn't ask me about nutrition. She didn't ask me about exercise. She didn't ask me any detailed questions about nutrition. Her first question, and it, I mean, I had hardly sat down, and it just came out of her mouth. I had no idea. Does the Bible say other things about health? And she opened the door wide open. Amen. That evening, I went to the second appointment knocked on the door, and it was almost a repeat. Question was a little different, phrased differently, but it was the same thing. And I said, this is really fun. And I began to realize the wisdom of that old man and what he told me that day. You know, sometimes I think we misunderstand that term disinterested benevolence. Sometimes we think it's that we just do good things and somehow people are just going to flock in. Nothing wrong with doing good things. But I think disinterested benevolence does not mean that we don't share our faith. I think it means that we don't do it in a way that is offensive. I think we're often also confused a little bit and fearful as I was way back then. I was confused between sharing doctrine and sharing Jesus. Now Jesus and doctrine are are closely integrated. Please don't under, misunderstand me. But sometimes, and I've seen this happen, especially now as I go and visit classes that other people are doing and they try to have a little devotional and somebody spends 30 minutes preaching a sermon on something that's unrelated to what they're talking about that evening, for the class. I've seen pastors dust off old sermons on the Sabbath or on the state of the dead and try and preach it to a health class. There is a time and a place for those things. Those are wonderful truths. But as you're introducing yourself and the church, to people who are interested in health, you need to be sharing with them how Jesus, or even what the Bible has to say about sugar. We talk about stress. How do we deal with stress? What a wonderful blessing. The Bible is filled with promises of encouragement for those who are discouraged and depressed and anxious. And that's what the world is filled with. And as you meet the needs of people, and you relate it to what you're talking about, it all becomes one cohesive message. And you're introducing to them physical, mental, and spiritual concepts. And that is not a violation of disinterested benevolence. We need to weave Jesus into our classes. Amen. Jesus and his love. And I'm not suggesting 
that in our programs we need to state, state the differentiating or cardinal doctrines. Or the 2300 days prophecy in an exercise class. It's not relevant. And I discovered way back then that three minutes of identifying myself as a spiritual person made all the difference in my visitation. And people never left. I can tell you that in seven and a half, in the, in the six and a half years following that, in that same location and same neighborhood, only one person left a class. And she left as I prayed in Christ's name. And I saw her leave. And the people who, my, from the church that had registered her saw her leave. And she was angry. And about a week later, I knew her name, where she had registered. I'm not sure what it was, but something got in me. And I said, I need to go call her up and then see if I can visit her. And she told me that she was Jewish and she had become angry. She was a lawyer. She was a brilliantly redheaded lawyer. Um, and uh, smart woman. But she had become angry that I had prayed in Christ's name. I called her up and I said, my wife and I would like to come and visit you. And she said, oh, that would be so kind. I would welcome a visit. And so we went and she lived in one of these high-rise apartments and you had to have special permission. I mean, she had to open the, the call the gate man or the doorman and so forth. Anyway, it was a palace that she lived in up there. And she was most, welcome, most welcoming, offered us some refreshments. We sat down in her living room and I apologized to her for offending her. And she looked at me and she said, you don't need to apologize. She said, I should have known I came to a Christian church. She said, and she told me her background, culturally, religiously. She wasn't really a religious Jew. She wasn't attending synagogue. This was a cultural thing for her. But she had gotten really angry that night. She said, don't even worry about it. It was my fault. We invited her to come back. She never did come back. But you know, for over 12 years, she sent us a Christmas card every Christmas. And we saw her several times, but her interest was not there. But at least that early anger had been resolved. And she felt, as far as we know, very warm and very friendly toward the church. That advice I received almost 40 years ago about identifying myself as a, as a spiritual person changed my ministry. I probably wouldn't be standing here together today if I had not received that. I'd been so frustrated, I'd have gone and done something else. I was afraid I'd lose my audience, that they'd be offended. My first steps were tentative and small. But God had a great work to do in me so that I became comfortable. And today, if I'm going to be talking about rest and sleep to a public audience, it's the Sabbath is a wonderful way of weaving in the truth of the Sabbath. But it's related. And it makes sense to people in the community. Ellen White tells us that medical missionary work is in no case to be divorced from the gospel ministry. The Lord has specified that the two shall be as closely connected as the arm is with the body. And without this union, neither part of the work is complete. The medical missionary work is the gospel in illustration. If somebody moves from being a smoker to a non-smoker, through the grace of Christ, that is an illustration of the gospel. For somebody who removes the lard from the crust of the apple pie that they make, that's a first step in conversion. A change of their lives. 
And I've actually had somebody tell me that it was only by the grace of Christ that they could remove the lard from their apple pie crust. And I said, praise the Lord. That's the way their grandparents had, their grandmother had made it. That's the way their mother had made it. That's the way she made it. That's the way she had taught her kids to make it. And now she was making it with shortening. And you go, oh, wait a minute, shortening. Be careful. That was a huge change in her life at that point. And she attributed to the grace of God. Praise his name. Health work is a wonderful opportunity of teaching the gospel in its practical application in people's lives. Because that's what you're dealing with. The gospel is, of health is to be firmly linked with the ministry of the word. It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great effort to proclaim the gospel message. That's the day and age in which you and I are living today. Jesus is coming soon. And he's given our church a special way of reaching out to the community that will reach people that will be reached in no other way. And we are told that. You know, there are a lot of godless behavior change programs out there. And unfortunately, there are some that are even walking around in Adventist churches. I have the privilege of, you know, working in many different cultures today. There's a big concern. Well, if I make it Christian, I'm going to offend my audience. Nobody will ever come. It all depends on how you do it. The goal of our programs must be to introduce people to the only power that can affect permanent change in their lives. And that's the power of God. Now, not everybody is willing to recognize that in the beginning. I'm going to tell you a story about Tom in a few minutes. You'll be amazed at what happened in his life. But he was unwilling to accept the concept that not only that he needed God, let alone that God did exist and was interested in helping him stop smoking. In Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3, we find a very clear description of those who come to our classes. And maybe if the shoes fit, a little bit of us too. Actually, it describes all of us. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Sometimes I've said that verse describes us all as being devilish, dead, disobedient, and depraved. And that's in many ways an apt description of humanity today, especially humanity without God. And so I have a picture of John. John is dead. What can we do for John in a health program? Think about it. Should we set a good example for John? You know, maybe we should model good exercise. We should eat right around him. We should show him that you don't smoke. And we should avoid depressive speech and attitudes. Is that going to bring John to life? It will not. But maybe we should educate him about the portion control and the problem of obesity today, the importance of avoiding trans fats, the dangers of cheese, stress management, depression recovery. 
Will that bring John to life? It will not. Should we give him encouragement? We can say, you can do it, John. Don't give up now. This is important. I remember being in a class once recently, I heard somebody say, it's very painful now, but you'll be glad when you get over it. Well, that may actually be true. No time to be discouraged, John. Will that bring John back to life? It won't. Maybe we should provide him a better environment. We can remove him from all the bad environment in which he lives. We can take him to a lifestyle center. Put him in with other successful people. Surround him with positive role models. Create an encouraging setting where he can make these important changes that he wants to make. Will that bring him back to life? No, it won't. These things do not bring the dead back to life. We can set all the examples we want, do all the good education, provide the encouragement, even the best environment. And if any of you are involved in Lifestyle Center, don't, don't leave here thinking I don't believe they can be effective. I spent 10 years of my life in a Lifestyle Center. Had wonderful experiences. But lifestyle centers do not bring people back to life. The next three verses in the same chapter of Ephesians 2, I think really brings the point home. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. About a year ago now, I was reading in my devotions. You know, sometimes you read things and it never makes an impression, and then many years later you read it again and you go, wow, was that really there? Well, that was one of these for me. To arouse those spiritually dead. To create new tastes, new motives. That's what we're doing in health ministry. New tastes, new motives. Requires as great an outlay of power as to raise one from physical death. Isn't that amazing? It is indeed giving life to the dead to convert the sinner from the error of his ways. And so I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon. You know, we pray for the sick. We pray for those who are nearly dead, asking the Lord by his grace to heal them. Maybe we should be praying for people who come to our health programs, recognizing that they are spiritually dead and that requires the same amount of power, the same kind of power as Christ used to raise the dead to life, literally. And if we recognize that, I think it changes the way we pray for those who come to our programs. It's not just a matter of doing a program and hoping that somehow we've made a good impression and that somehow they're going to start asking questions about why we live the way we live. They're spiritually dead. And we need to be praying for their resurrection by the grace of Christ, not by the smartness of our program or our presentations, as important as those things are. Jesus is the life giver. The health message is not to be separated from the gospel message. You know, a few of the health promoting effects of health message have been confirmed by science. But today's most skillful and perceptive scientist cannot bring the dead to life. It is only the gospel that actually brings the dead to life. 
And the health message expands the gospel and it brings life more abundantly. Jesus is the life giver and Jesus is the health giver. When we recognize these concepts, it changes the way we approach health ministry and it prepares us to be successful in the work that God has called us to do. And so our mission is to recognize that when the health message loses, that the health message loses its power if it is separated from the gospel message. If a person attends a health program in a Seventh-day Adventist church and understands and applies the principles, they may be gained a few years of life. And that's wonderful. But if they did not learn that the power to change comes from Jesus, then we've really failed in our mission to the community. You know, James says in, in the book of James, works without faith is dead. And I would submit to you tonight or this afternoon that science without Jesus is dead also. Now, if you're a physician or you're involved in medical care in this country, you're well aware of the term medical malpractice. You may live in a little bit of fear. And uh, those of you who don't, medical malpractice is professional negligence by act or omission by a health care provider in which the treatment provided falls below the accepted standard of practice in the medical community and causes injury or death to the patient, with most cases involving medical error. I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon that there is also something called spiritual malpractice. Spiritual malpractice is something that unfortunately many of us have been guilty of in our health programs. And I would define spiritual malpractice as negligence by act or omission by a Christian who fails to share the availability of God's power to change and to heal, thereby causing continuing pain and injury and eventual eternal death. And we should not be guilty of spiritual malpractice. As a health educator, I have often talked to many, many people of all walks of life, wondering should we do a health program or an evangelistic program? And I don't think it's a one or the other. I think we are called to do health evangelism. Now we might ask the question, which is import more important is health? Well, the benefits are temporary, but the person dies anyway at some point. We all do, as long as Christ hasn't returned. Well, what about evangelism? Well, its benefits, when accepted, are eternal. And it really doesn't matter if you die. So I hope you begin to see the foundational importance of making sure that we share Jesus as that agent of change that is available for people to choose in their lives that they too might become better people. New creatures, if you will. That they can be restored to life through the grace and power of our Savior Jesus. We should ever remember that the object of the medical missionary work is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary who takes away the sin of the world. That's what the object of health ministry is all about, is to point them to Jesus. And if we fail to do that, we failed in our mission. 
The second principle that I believe is extremely important is that we must focus on building long-term relationships. You know, traditional health ministry is where we host an event that happens four nights a week, maybe for four to six weeks in length. Professionals do the presentations, or today we use DVDs or something like that. This event interrupts the life of the church, and when it's over, we breathe a collective sigh of relief. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Thank you, brother. A number of years ago, April and I were doing a cooking class on the East Coast. Whoever in the local church was appointed the, the responsibilities of publicizing had, had done an extremely good job because we ended up with 300 people in our cooking class, a little over 300, when we thought we'd get about 80 to 90. Now, those of you who have done cooking classes know how much work that is. So we worked hard. And there were some people in the church who came every night. There were two, two senior ladies who came to wash dishes. They said, we can't do anything but wash dishes. Oh, I said, that would be wonderful. So every night after the class they came, on the last night, everybody had left, we'd said our goodbyes to everybody that had come. It had been, you know, from numerical standpoint, a very successful class, but we were making friends with people and they were get, asking all kinds of questions and we were getting excited about the potential and some of the church members were too. They had all gone. I was carrying a tray of dishes to the sink to be washed. And these two ladies did not know I was coming. And one of them, who had her hand in the soapy dishwasher, dishwater, pulled her hand out and suds on her elbow or on her arm. She wiped it across her forehead and as she turned to the other lady and said, Phew, we don't have to do this for two more years. That was a pivotal moment, pivotal moment in my ministry. From all intents and purposes, we'd had a very successful class. But when she said that, it set me thinking. On the way home that night, in the car, I turned to my wife, children were asleep in the back seat, and I said to my wife, I have a question for you. She said, what's that? You always have questions. I said, well, this is an important one. When we were first getting acquainted, we were beginning, we'd had a couple of, we'd had several dates in college. If I had come to you and said one evening, you know, April, I really, really like you. And I'm looking forward to getting better acquainted with you. But you know, I have papers to write. I have exams to prepare for, and so do you. Could we make an appointment 12 months from now to meet again? Would you have married me? Oh, you know her answer. <laughs> Said no. To to build a relationship, it takes time. We have to invest in that relationship. And I would like to suggest to you that we don't win souls without making friends first. And if we don't take time in investing in those friendships, we thwart our mission. Here we were, just beginning to make friends with these people. And these two ladies, bless their heart, they were wonderful ladies. They had been so helpful during our entire class. But they said, Phew, we don't have to do it for two more years. When we 
make friends, begin to make friends and then drop them and then try to revive them again, it's even harder. And so we need to find some way of continually building long-term relationships. Today, free time status has changed. 20 to 40 years ago, people had more free time. You agree with that? Just look at it. There's data that supports that too. A program that convenes 20 or more times in four to six weeks actually excludes a majority of people in your community. And when we do, we attract primarily the retired, the unemployed, or the socially unique. Now, there are exceptions, and we're grateful for that, but they're rare. But you know, many, many years ago in the book Evangelism, Ellen White spoke about this very issue. For she wrote, the years, for years, light has been given upon this point, showing the necessity of following up an interest that has been raised and in no case leaving it until all have decided that lean toward the truth and have experienced the conversion necessary for baptism and united with some church or formed one themselves. Now that's in the context of the evangelist, but I think it equally, employ, it equally applies in the context of the health evangelist. We do things very episodically, you know, and we wear ourselves out. And we have no strength. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough people, team members. And so we begin to make friends, and then we hope we can revive those a year later or two years later. And it doesn't work that way. And so I would like to suggest to you that we need a paradigm shift in our thinking. That we need to begin thinking about what I call low intensity, high impact programs. Those that have continual influence in the community from month to month or year to year. They tend not to wear out the talent pool of the church members. And they don't wear out the attendees. And they maximize the church community interface when they're done properly. And they can be conducted in any church, in any community, irregardless of the talent mix. At lunch today, I was thrilled. I was unaware of this. But you know, that's one of the wonderful things. The Lord never speaks to one person only. He speaks to people around the globe. But at lunch today, I discovered as I was sitting at the table that there was a lady there who has done a once a month cooking class for 27 years. Now that's amazing commitment. Ruth, you can talk to her afterwards if you want to know more about it. More than 20 years ago, I became impressed that rather than, and, and it began, that thinking began after this lady went, Phew, we don't have to do it for two more years. I said, wait a minute, what's wrong here? We were worn out. <laughs> they were worn out. And the people in the class were worn out. And it was probably about 25 years ago now that I was a conference health ministries director and there was this dying church. It was in a dying logging community, old logging, ex-logging community. High school was nearly, uh, the church school had, had disappeared. The church had almost disappeared. There were only about seven people attending church in our church where they used to have well over a hundred, a thriving church. And they said, we want to do something for the community. And we want to do a cooking class. And when I went down to visit them, I discovered that they were both in their mid-70s. And I thought, a cooking class? They said, what can we do? And I suggested to them, maybe they do a once a month little vegetarian supper. 
I don't have time to tell you all the things that the Lord did through those two ladies and the rest of their team. But in that dying community, over a 10-year period of time, that church went from seven members to almost 85 members. And every one who joined that church had come to the Vegetarian Supper Club. And at that club, they had served a simple supper. People love to eat. Sometimes we, you know, this was not a Sabbath after church spread. This was a simple supper, maybe some soup and a slice of bread. And then they showed them how to make the soup. One demonstration. And then a little health talk. And it was usually on a video or DVD. And then when they had, when the, when the satellite meetings came around, they called me and said, what do we do? We can't do our class because they're going to be a... I said, why don't you invite the people who are coming to your supper club? And they went out and they knocked on the doors of all the people. And there were about 50 of them coming every month. And they did some things like, you know, if you're a church member, you can't sit at a table with another church member unless it's your first degree relative. You've got to sit at a table and get acquainted with people. And started in the fellowship hall down in the basement of their church. They had to go to the high school because so many people wanted to come. They went out and invited people to this, uh, this satellite meeting. Said, we're not going to have a class, but you're welcome to come. We're going to be having these meetings. They're going to start at this date. They gave them a little card that had the information about it. When the satellite meetings were over, 18 people had made a decision for Jesus Christ. They went, in a matter of six months, from seven people to, 20, to 29 members baptized. And it continued for 10 years. Well, actually, it continued for longer than 10 years. But in 10 years, they had about 85 people. So don't become weary and well-doing. But don't try to do more than you can do. Now, there are many other things you can do. You don't have to do vegetarian supper clubs. I'm aware of that. Actually, we, my wife and I began one before this little church began theirs in the church where we were serving at that time. And they have been doing it for almost 30 years now, once a month. And you say, well, 12 times a year? No, not quite. We found, at least in our culture in the U.S., that between Thanksgiving and New Year's is almost impossible. Too many things are going on. And sometimes in August, July, August, either the weather doesn't cooperate or you've got some ball game or something that a community event, and this is especially true in smaller towns where you need to be very sensitive to the culture of the town and what's going on. You know, in a big city, there's so many things that conflict with schedules, you can do almost anything you want when you want to do it. Because it's always going to be, there's going to be something that, that it, you're interrupting. Um, and people expect that. But uh, when you're in a little town, that's a little different. And you need to be sensitive to that. But, you know, it's ten times a, a year on an ongoing basis. Anyway, we need to really look at some more low-intensity programs. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do a CHIP program or can, can't do a, you know, a, a whatever program you wish to do that's a little more intense, but you need to follow it up. You need to follow it up, something regular, so you continue to make those friendships and grow those friendships. It is through the social relations that Christianity comes in contact with the world. Social relations sanctified by the Spirit of Christ must be improved in bringing souls to the Savior. 
You know, individual needs matter. When we look at Scripture, we see that the message of Jesus speaks to individual needs. There was one sheep out of a hundred that got individual attention. There was one coin out of many. There was one blind man in a crowd. There was one planet out of billions. And we live on that planet. Small deeds are important. The widow's might. The cup of cold water. A visit with a prisoner. A meal to relieve hunger. All play their role in building friendships for the, for the kingdom. We need to recognize that health ministry is a process. It's not an event. And too often, we see it as an event. We are going to do such and such, and we can check it off on the reports to wherever. That's not what it's all about. It's a process of ministry. And we must have structured follow-up activities. Okay, I need to speed up here. The next point is that we need to love people more than we do the health principles. Now you may say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You know, Adventists are very interesting. I was recently in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, teaching in a, oh, just an amazing place. 23 years now, they've had a beautiful center, retreat center. They can, they can house 350 people and feed them all at the same time. They have classrooms and, my... And it's dedicated to training people for health ministry. I had no idea it existed. They had a health summit, and they had so many people responded that they, they called me and they said, can you stay for an extra, can you double the time you're coming? Because we're going to take one group through, 350, and then we're going to take another group through of 350. So it was over two weekends, and in the middle of the week it changed. But I was talking about this very principle there, and after the class, a lady came up to me in tears. She could hardly hold herself together. And she said, I'm a new member. I've been a member of your church for four, four months. And I wanted to learn about health. And she said, I want you to know that I was going to leave after your lecture. My bag is all packed, and I have a taxi coming to pick me up. But she said, I'm going to I think I'm going to stay. I said, well, tell me what happened. She said, this is all through, translator. She said, this morning in the breakfast line, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And I turned around, and this person looked me in my face, put her finger in my face, and said... If you're going to represent Jesus, you need to lose more weight. She said, since I have come in contact with the Adventist church, I've lost 90 pounds. And it's still coming off. She said, thank you for telling the story. And I'm going to tell you that story now. Because it, it breaks my heart, it needs to break your heart, and you need to realize how sometimes our words and attitudes affect people. I was in a church, won't tell you where, and I preached a sermon on health. It was here in North America. It was in a conference that I had worked in for many years. I knew the church well. They invited me to the potluck. Went downstairs to Fellowship Hall. I was asked to say the blessing. And they wanted me to come to the head of the line to do that. And I thought I'd go to the back and let all the hungry kids go first. But uh, 
that wasn't to be. There was a lady who was very much in charge of the potluck. You know those kind. And as soon as I said amen, there was a plate in front of my hands. And there was no fighting it, so I took it. And as I grabbed that plate, this lady, in a voice that everybody in the entire fellowship hall heard clearly, she said with her bony finger, that dish has real cheese in it. Everybody was looking, and they were all looking to see what I was going to do. Had no comment been made, I'd have walked right past that dish. It was not my favorite dish. And I breathed a quick prayer, said, Lord, what do I do? And I took one small spoonful of it, and when I did, she went, And everybody watched everything I took. Now, there were lots of wonderful, healthy choices on the table. And I had plenty to eat, went to the table, had a nice time of fellowship. When it was over with, and as I walked out of the, out of the fellowship hall into the hallway in the basement of that church, there was a lady standing against the wall with tears coming down her cheeks. No elder, no pastor. I walked over to her and I said, ma'am, is there any, something I could do to help you? And she began crying more, and she said, I am the lady who made that dish with real cheese. She said, I am so glad you took one spoonful, because I am coming back to this church, because you did that. Now, I just praise the Lord. I said, there's a story. Tell me, ma'am. And so we went upstairs to the little foyer, and I sat down, and she proceeded to tell me that four weeks before she had been baptized, nobody had ever talked to her about any nutritional principles at all. She said, you know, I did hear that, they, that you don't eat ham, so this morning I took the ham out of that dish. I said, thank you very much. Praise the Lord. <laughs> she said, I told my husband... That if that happens, she said, this is the third time it's happened. A comment has been made about the food she brought. And she said, I told my husband, if it happens again, I'll never darken the door of that church. And she said, I love the message. It's made such a difference in my life. I have hope when I didn't have hope. I long for Jesus to come. I love the Sabbath. But she said, I just can't stand what goes on here? And I said, ma'am, there's nothing I can do to excuse it. Let me talk to you for a few minutes. And I, I just shared with her from my heart. I shared with her a little bit about the health message. We talked for about an hour, and it was time I had to go. And um, on the way home, I picked up my cell phone, and I called the pastor. And I said, you've got a problem. He said, tell me. I told him. He said, my wife and I will go visit her this evening. The very next Sabbath, my wife and I were in Atlanta for general conference. And I was elected unexpectedly. I had no idea to go to the general conference. And my life has been <laughs> at 150 miles an hour since then. I never had a chance to follow up, but a couple of years ago, I had a few moments and I called this pastor. I said, tell me what happened. I want to know the rest of the story. Oh, he said, my wife and I went that evening. We talked with that lady. We prayed with her. He said, my wife threw her arms around her. We had her come to our home. We gave her some cooking lessons. We talked about the health message. And she, he said, you will be happy to know that she's in charge of potluck now. And I said, what happened? <laughs> I couldn't resist. What happened to the other lady? Oh, he said, we've had a number of problems, not just in that area with her. And he said, my wife and I and an elder went to visit her. 
And we had to talk to her about these things. She took offense and he said, she's not coming to church anymore. At least our church. But he said, we're better off without her. But he said, the best news is that two weeks ago, I baptized this lady's, the lady that made the dish with the real cheese, I baptized her husband. And they are both now together in the faith. I, unfortunately, this kind of problem is, exists around the world. It existed when Ellen White was alive and unfortunately will exist. But I want to ask all of you to please, please become a part of dealing with those issues in a positive way. Don't encourage them. Don't be fanatics. We need to love people more than we do the health message. I love this statement. It's in one of the little pamphlets. It never got into the other publications, but Ellen White said, we don't make the health reform an iron bedstead, cutting people off or stretching them out to fit it. One person cannot be a standard for everybody else. What we want is a little sprinkling of good common sense. Don't be extremists. If you err, it would be better to err on the side of the people than on the side where you cannot reach them. That lady was almost at the point of not being reached. I mean, she had been reached, but she was being driven away. The lady in Brazil was driven away by that finger in her face. We need to love people. Now, I love the health message. I love the principles of the health message. Don't leave here saying that I don't. Please. But we need to love people more than we love the health principles. Um, just the last sentence there. These extremists do more harm in a few months than they can undo in a lifetime. They are engaged in a work which Satan loves to see go on. And that's why we see what we see in some of our churches. It's inspired by the devil. I love this statement. Councils on Health, page 449. Let them find out what constitutes true health reform and teach its principles both by precept and by a quiet, consistent example. We don't have to shout it from the rooftops. Somebody wrote me just this week and said, and this is tongue in cheek and I understand it, and you will too. They said it's very easy to tell who is a vegan. You only have to listen to them for three minutes and they'll tell you ten times. Now we chuckle. And if we do it right with a balanced diet, there's nothing wrong with that. That's for sure. Probably has more and more of the weight of more and more evidence on that side. But I'm talking about an attitude, a prickly attitude. And people don't like to hear that. And, but it's not just that they don't like it. It's that it drives them away. And we mustn't do that. Next principle, just for a moment. Let's we'll spend a few moments. We're best, we're, it's best to do our programs in our local churches, wherever it's possible. And we're counseled, Councils on Diets and Foods, 470, in every place where a church has been established, let the church members walk humbly before God and let them seek to enlighten the people with health reform principles. Medical missionary work is to occupy a rightful place as it ever should have done in every church in our land. There are many advantages to doing it in the church. The church is the Christian's home. The church supports, and, and when we do it there, it supports the wise use of the resources that we have. So often we think, sometimes we think, that we'd better off to go to a local hotel and rent a room 
or a public hall. But if we're going to bring them to the church, we still have to bring them to church at some point. And we can make friends with them in the church. And that church I mentioned earlier, but had a large Jewish neighborhood, I had an elder come to me and say at the very beginning, you're going to have to go down and rent a room in the Sheraton Hotel. Nobody will come to our church. And I said, but this is health evangelism. You, hold, you had evangelistic meetings last year. Did you go to the Sheraton? No, he said, we did those in the church. I said, well, we're going to do them in the church too, our programs. He said, nobody will come. He said, I'll give you six months. He was on my committee. He was a very influential person in that church. But I felt very convicted about that. And I can tell you that over seven years of working in that community, we had over 4,000 non-Adventists darken the door of that church for health programs of at least four nights each. So those 4,000 came at least four nights. We did some one-day things too. But they came because we addressed the needs that they had. There are some places where we don't have churches, and that's fine. I understand no fellowship halls, no place for a cooking class. We have to do the best we can. But I think as far as possible, certainly in our country where we're rich and increased with churches and church buildings, we can do them in our church buildings. Next principle is that we need to be based on sound science. And I'll tell you why. A lot of people say, ah, oh, you just have too much training. You're just too critical of, you know, all these things that go on. Some of these things. But let me tell you a story of a weight control class that I did in a community. There was a man in that class who on the first night didn't even want to mention his name. And when I asked everybody to share their first name and why they had come, it came his time and he was about as low in the seat as I've ever seen anybody get. And he mumbled, he said, my name is Joe, and I'm here because she made me come. His wife was sitting next to him. I never thought I'd see him again. In fact, he said that the first night, I'm not coming back. I had no idea who he was. But you know, the next night, the next week he was back, and the next week he was back, and the next week he was back. And, he was back. and, when, and when the program finished, he came up to me and he said, this has been the most wonderful program I've ever gone to. And I thought, well, that's very nice. I said, thank you very much. He was shaking my hand. He said, let me introduce myself to you. He said, you only know me as Joe. I said, yeah, that's right. I'm curious. He said, I'm Dr. Joe so-and-so. I said, really? I'm very glad to meet you. I'm happy to have you in this class. Oh, he said, it's, again, he said, this is the best class I've come to. They've ever been to. He said, I said, well, tell me what, you know, what branch of medicine, where do you practice, so forth. Turns out he's a, not only a psychiatrist, he's a bariatric. He's specialized in bariatric medicine. And for those of you who don't know about bariatric medicine, that's those, that, those are psychiatrists who specialize in helping people lose weight. He said, I've learned more here than I learned in all of my residency about losing weight. I said, well, praise the Lord. Actually, I said thank you to him. He, at that point, I wasn't sure where he was spiritually. But I said, praise the Lord, in my mind. He said, I have a question for you. Can I refer my patients to your class in the future? I said, absolutely. For the next five years, more than half of our weight control class participants came from his practice and his personal referral. Many, many years ago, somebody said to me, when you speak about health principles, always remember that there will be somebody in your class who knows more than you do about a narrow area of science. So don't make things up. And I have found that to be true. I got acquainted with Joe 
I had the privilege, actually, of baptizing he and his wife several years later. But as I got acquainted with him, he told me many times, he said, what you, I would have never, I'd have never stayed, I'd have never referred my patients. But he said, you knew what you were talking about. And he said, when you were asked a question that you didn't know about, you said, I don't know, but I'll try and find out the answer. We, there, is a, there is a very real reason why we are counseled and we should make sure that our classes are based upon science. And we find that in Councils on Health, page 452, it's very clear. If they see that we are intelligent with regard to health, they will be more ready to believe that we are sound in Bible doctrines. When we espouse nutty health stuff, and there's plenty of it out there. We are undermining our ability to teach the Bible. We need to base our programs on sound science. They're extremists. Their works and words can be spared, for they do more injury than the wisest and most intelligent men with the best influence they can exert can counteract. It is impossible for the best qualified advocates of health reform to fully relieve the minds of the public from the prejudice received through the wrong course of these extremists and to place the great subject of health reform upon a right basis in the community where these men have figured. And then the last principle I want to share with you is that we need to sell only information, good information, accurate information. We need to avoid conflicts of interest. Every once in a while I run, run into somebody and says, oh, I'm going to do health classes, and as I talk to them, I discover that they see it as an opportunity of improving their network marketing or their downline or whatever you call it. My friends, that has no place in our work. We need to be teaching people good information, not selling products. It never works. People see through our motives. You all know the story of Naaman, wonderful story. We won't take time to go through that, but there is a sad chapter in that story, and that's the story of Gehazi and his greed. Gehazi was, had conflict of interest. You see, the prophet had sent him down to meet this very important man, and he saw with his own eyes all the wealth that he brought with him, and, Gehazi, and the prophet didn't ask for anything. And when Naaman was healed, word came, I'm sure the prophet and Gehazi knew what had happened. And Gehazi had a bee in his head, and it, that was the wealth. And he said, wait a minute, I could profit from that. And he lied to the prophet, and he went after Naaman, and he caught up with him, and he lied to Naaman, and Naaman gave him exactly what he asked for or more. He gave him more out of a thankful heart from a healed person. And then Gehazi came back and hid it in his house, and went to the prophet, and the prophet said, Where were you? The Lord had showed him. And the leprosy that had been removed from Naaman was inflicted upon Gehazi, and he became a leper. You know, the temptation to sell something to those who are disadvantaged by disease and personally profit from it can be very strong. And there are plenty of products, plenty of organizations that are out there trying to captivate your attention and get you to do that. But it has no place in true health ministry. And I get, I get frustrated when I see unproven health products. Uh, sorry. Multi-level marketing schemes, the nutraceuticals, the, bo the botanicals, it, it, it makes me sick when, they see, when I see them masquerading as health ministry because they are not. 
we need to be selling only good information. Solomon, I, I'm sorry, solemn are the lessons taught by this experience of one to whom has been given high and holy privileges. The course of Gehazi was such as to place a stumbling block in the pathway of Naaman, upon whose mind had broken a wonderful light, and who was favorably disposed toward the service of the living God. The Bible record makes it clear that Naaman's faith was not shaken by Gehazi's behavior. And I praise the Lord for that. His faith remained strong, even as he went back to, his, to Babylon. The solution is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 33. Not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Wise, wise Bible counsel. We live in a land of plenty, of huge abundance. And when I think of the enormous amounts that some spend on supplements and nutraceuticals and you name it, I begin to wonder if these things are so necessary for health. If they are so necessary for health, is God relegating the majority of the world who are poor to poor health because they can't afford these things? When we do health ministry successfully. I think our churches will display some DNA markers of Christ-like health ministry. This is my last slide. What will it look like? It will look as if Jesus was back in town again. You agree with that? Our health ministry needs to look like Jesus was there. Number two. It will be a ministry, not just a program or methodology. It's a ministry. It's a one-to-one, -one building friends, networking, increasing the interface between the church and the community. Number three, we will be concerned with wellness, not just the treatment of disease. And number four, it will involve a continuum of whole person care. The lady who made that dish with real chase, her need that evening, that afternoon, was not to learn anything more about nutrition. Her need was for her heart to be healed from the sharp words that had been publicly stated about what she had done and her motives questioned. You hear the term comprehensive health ministry more and more. And that's what we've been talking about today. A ministry that reaches out and meets the needs of people in a way that draws them to our Savior Jesus. May God strengthen and bless each one of you. As you go back to your churches, as you lead out in various activities, as you have opportunity to provide counsel and wisdom, Let's make sure we're doing Christ's work, Christ's way, so that we can have his full blessing and see the results that he desires in doing his work, his way, in these last days of earth's history. That's my prayer for each one of you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for the many blessings you give to us. We thank you for this health message, for its beauty, for its balance, for its soundness. But most of all, we praise you that as, it, as we seek to present it through your grace, through your strength, that it will meet people's needs. And then we ask that you would give us the strength, give us the wisdom we need to nurture those friendships for your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.